Well, good morning. Time for us to begin the Bible study this morning. We are uh, continuing with our study of the uh, church, and uh, this morning the topic is uh, church cooperation, and of course a uh, topic uh, that uh, we all have some familiarity with. It doesn't hurt to go back and uh, review these topics from time to time. Of course, it might seem strange to those who just walk in from outside to talk about church cooperation, uh, particularly when we began with the negative about church cooperation. What could, after all, be wrong with cooperation? We all need to cooperate. Uh, and, of course, that's uh, uh, a general axiom that has a great deal of truth, but obviously there are some limitations on that. We don't want to cooperate in those things which are wrong. We wouldn't want to cooperate with those who were terrorists, and we wouldn't want to cooperate with those who were uh, uh, selling illegal drugs. We wouldn't want to cooperate in bad things. On the other hand, we might even take it a little further than that. Uh, that we as Christians don't want to cooperate and do things in ways that are different than what God intends for us to do. We talked over the last couple of weeks about the work of the church and emphasized, of course, the principal work of the church that is the uh, expressing the manifold wisdom of God, that it is the uh, collectivity of the saints and that we are uh, engaged in an effort of preaching the gospel uh, and uh, reaching those who are lost and uh, increasing the number of those who are added to the body as saved. That uh, there are lots of other good works that the uh, church might do, but those are not things that are authorized by the Scripture. And so uh, even in the idea of cooperating in good things, there might be some limits on what the uh, church would do. I think one of the ways in which to uh, set the stage for this is to recognize that this is a topic that probably would not have been a conversation in the first century. It is a topic that arises because of the ingenuity of people and uh, maybe even the good-hearted ingenuity of people who set about to do good things and to do things in ways that they think are going to be effective. But very frequently, the choices they make about that are not in keeping with uh, what uh, God has intended outside of his pattern. And maybe at first you don't recognize that's the case. But as the issue progresses, you begin to say, well, wait a minute, somehow we've gotten to a place we didn't intend to be. I think that's very much the way it is with what we call the institutional churches this day and age. There are a lot of the older elders in those congregations who look around with amusement and say, how did we get to this point where the membership is principally there just for the entertainment, uh, when they are there for the fishes and the loaves, as it were, and not really focused on spiritual matters? How did we get to this point where we spend all of our time involved in bureaucratic administration of programs and not as we studied uh, in uh, Acts chapter uh, 6, where the uh, apostles say, should we leave off the ministry of the word for the attending to tables? And the elders find themselves in that situation and they say, how did we get here? And uh, we might take warning by saying, well, let's see, how did they get there? And here's the mistake they made, and we don't want to make that kind of mistake. So uh, I think probably what I will do is uh, go through some of these uh, topics and uh, presentation, and uh, as there are questions along the way, we can handle some of those, but uh, maybe particularly specific issues that uh, we're concerned about we can deal with later. There are two forms of uh, extra-biblical cooperation that we should be opposed to. Two kinds, I think, I can identify, and one of those is institutionalism. That is the idea that churches will establish some kind of extra biblical institution in order to do the work that the church has assigned to it. We talked about the preaching of the gospel, and uh, the church ought to be involved in the preaching of the gospel. And we might, in our ingenuity, say we could be a whole lot more effective at preaching the gospel if we established some kind of cooperative to do that, if we pool together our resources and establish some kind of a school that would preach, or some kind of band of traveling preachers, and if we had some administration to that and some formality to that, we could do a great job. But that's outside of the scope of the Scriptures, and that kind of institutionalism is something I think we need to be careful about. Secondly is the idea of the sponsoring churches. Um, sponsoring churches, another way in which 
we find uh, churches cooperating together that I think are dubious based on uh, the pattern of the New Testament. Uh, that is when uh, the work seems too big for one church to do, too many opportunities. And of course, once again, you know, with the very best interest, the very best intentions, uh, church says we could do a whole lot better at this if other congregations would send us some money so we could uh, carry out this work. And uh, so the other congregations start sending some money and pretty soon you have this sponsoring church that has elders who are making judgments about how the work ought to be done and what should be done with the money. And the other congregations end up being just sort of, well, feeders uh, maybe even just sort of uh, fun collectors for the bigger church. The elders there have no control over what uh, is being preached or who is doing the preaching. Both of those things I think we will find are going to be outside of the Bible because the principle is uh, the authority of the Scriptures. And if you want to know what the difference is between churches of Christ and denominations, uh, this is the fundamental issue. The church is to follow the pattern of the New Testament. And sometimes people think of us as legalists or pharisaical because we're scrutinizing very carefully not only the Scriptures but what we do. And sometimes we deserve some sorts of criticism for that because sometimes we're sort of hypocritical. We're very careful here and not so careful over there. But that's our failing and not the failing of the principle. The principle is that we have to pay attention to the authority of the Scriptures. And as we have gotten to this point, it's clear that the issue of cooperation is closely related to how we understand the organization and the work of the church. Uh, Milton led us in a discussion of uh, the distinction between the universal church and the local congregations, and it's important to recognize that there's one universal church that is the body of Christ, and uh, that this is the church that Jesus built, but there is no earthly organization for this universal church. They're just the local congregations, and each of these local congregations are autonomous, independent from one another, even though they share the same kind of goals. And you may recognize this in the Colossians chapter 4 and verse 15, where the Apostle Paul, writing to the Colossian church, says to them that uh, he wants them to send the letter that he's written to them to the Laodiceans. And by the way, I want you to read the letter to the Laodiceans. They share together this common kind of goal. Whatever it is that the Apostle Paul is writing about to one will be of interest to the other. Clearly, that's a matter of great interest to us. We read and scrutinize the letter to the Colossians even today and find it valuable for us as a congregation of the Lord's people. And, of course, we spend, by the way, a lot of time trying to figure out what's the Laodicean letter. Uh, was that the letter to the Ephesians? I seriously doubt it. It's a letter that we don't have because the Lord figured we already had enough information to know how we should conduct ourselves. But they would have been interested in the same things, and so sharing their letters with one another would have been a reasonable thing to do. That level of cooperation is certainly warranted, but they are still autonomous as we see the pattern of the uh, New Testament church. There is a pattern. That's fundamental. And maybe we need to just review that for a moment. Certain passages of Scripture indicate that's the case. There was a pattern in the Old Testament. God said to Moses, I want you to build the tabernacle in this fashion. I want you to build it exactly this way, these dimensions with these materials, and I want you to put it together and organize it in this fashion. See that you build it according to the pattern that I gave you, he said. Which, of course, we might say that's Old Testament stuff. You know, that doesn't really affect us today, except that in Hebrews chapter 8, and of course the whole book of Hebrews is saying we have a better covenant now than the old one. Here's the way the old one was. Here's the way the new one is. And there's some buts here. The old one had animal sacrifices, but we have the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But some principles remain the same. See, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern. That's just the way we did it in the Old Testament, and that's the principle we're going to follow in this New Testament, this new covenant, is that we're going to do things according to the pattern. And I think most Bible students would recognize that that's the case. Uh, we get into some differences of opinion, perhaps, about exactly what the pattern says. And I, I can always talk honestly with people who say, I think the Bible says this is what we should do. And I can say, well, I think we ought to look at this passage, 
but we have a common principle, a common ground. Now, when people say, I don't care what the pattern says, I think we ought to do it this way, that's where we have uh, really gone far astray. The same kind of things show up in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus uh, suggests to the Pharisees they were wrong because they were teaching for commandments, uh, the commandments of men rather than the commandments of God. And in Galatians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul said, look, I've told you what you ought to do. If anybody comes to you and tells you something different, even, even if it's an angel, don't listen to them. You got what you need to have in order to uh, to uh, develop the church and to uh, uh, manage the church and uh, the work that you're supposed to do. Somebody comes along with something else, let him be accursed. He used pretty strong language there. We, we say, let him be accursed. I think probably uh, in the uh, vernacular of the day, when they said that, it might have been a little stronger than you know our sense of let him be accursed. Um, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11 reminds us that we ought to speak as the oracles of God speak and uh, that uh, where those things uh, are, are not stated in the scriptures, you know, we need to be careful. Maybe there's a case where we have liberty, but maybe that's a case where we're being innovative and in adding to and changing the nature of what God has prescribed. Um, you should abide within the doctrine, going beyond the doctrine doing things that are not authorized is as bad as not doing things that you're commanded to do. And uh, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, Paul says, I've applied these things to myself and to Apollos figuratively so that you may learn not to go beyond what is written. There is a pattern, in other words, for the things that we do in service to God. And we're very careful about that pattern, very careful about the pattern for the Lord's Supper, very careful about the pattern for worship of the church, and we ought to be very careful about the work of the church as well. And review this for a moment. There is a single universal church. There is not a multiplicity of churches. There is only this one church. And this is the church that is under the headship of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm going to build my church. And there's going to be this one body. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, there's this one universal church. Everybody who is saved, everybody who's a part of the kingdom of God, who lives in the earth now, is a member of this universal church. You and I have nothing we can say about who gets added to that church or who is not a part of that church. We probably don't even know for sure who is a member of this universal church and who is not. We certainly pray that we are. We try and follow the scriptures to assure that we are. And we can apply that pattern in trying to teach others how they may get added to the church. But we don't have much to do with that. It is Jesus who is the head of this universal church. It is his body and he, he uh, establishes all things in it. Um, just as, uh, well, that probably doesn't make the point today, does it? The way husbands are the head of their wives. Uh, maybe that's why we preach it the other way generally. Husbands ought to be, or wives ought to be in subjection to their husband in the way that church is in subjection to Jesus Christ. But the point is that it is his and that he is the one who authorizes how it should conduct its affairs. Um, now we understand that there are then numerous local congregations, lots of local congregations who are, uh, um, uh, who, whose members are supposedly members of the universal church. There is no intervening kind of organization mentioned anywhere in scripture. There is no kind of, uh, earthly headquarters for the church universal. There is no one congregation in Jerusalem that we go to to settle our differences. There is no one congregation in Rome or some building in Rome that we can go to that will establish uh, how we should conduct ourselves or settle differences between congregations or assign churches to congregations. It's one of the differences, you see, between churches of Christ, local congregations of churches of Christ, and denominations. Because all the denominations have these kind of intervening hierarchical structures because that's what men know how to do. They suppose that they are part of the church universal, 
the church that Jesus established. And here we have these local congregations, the Christians, but in between them, there's a headquarters somewhere that tells them how they're supposed to behave and what they're supposed to do and what they're supposed to believe. They are denominations because they have those separate headquarters that make those decisions for them. Churches of Christ in the New Testament have no such hierarchical sort of arrangement, no intervening organization. The congregations do not make up the Church of Christ universal. The Church of Christ universal is made up of all the Christians who are parts of those local congregations. It's a critically important distinction to recognize that there, there is no intervening earthly manifestation of the universal church. There are only the local congregations. That's the only agency through which the church operates in the world today. And each one of those have their own organization. They are under elders and deacons. And those elders and deacons provide the structure for and the uh, decisions for that congregation. No one congregation can intervene into the affairs of another. And of course, we might have lots of speculation about that. We might say, whoa, you know, you're just going to have chaos. You know, they're all going to be doing all kind of different things. On the other hand, we might say, well, that's good. If one of them breaks down, it doesn't influence all the rest of them. Because we can see that sort of problem of apostasy that exists, uh, say, for instance, with the Roman Catholic Church. The whole reason the Roman Catholic Church became what it was was because lots of little congregations had lots of little problems and bigger congregations wanted to help them out. So they'd send teachers to them and they would uh, assign teachers to them and they would solve their problems. And then they began to feel a responsibility for, oh, over there they have some kind of heresy, we've got to straighten that out. And so pretty soon they had a controlling organization for all the little congregations. But then what happens when that one controlling organization begins to follow into a false doctrine and goes into some kind of apostasy? All the rest of them follow into that too. So we might on the one hand say to ourselves, well, the Lord needs an intervening organization. That's what the denominations have done. Or we might say to ourselves, you know, it's a great thing that we don't have that because I can see the problems with it. Well, that's really sort of irrelevant. What is relevant is that the New Testament pattern, there is no intervening organization. We wouldn't know how to set it up. We wouldn't know where it was supposed to be. We wouldn't know what it was supposed to do. All of that we just have to make up. So if you're interested in the biblical pattern, you say to yourselves, okay, we got local congregations and they have their own elders. And recognize what the emphasis is here. They appointed elders in every church. They're not elders in a region who govern all the little churches. Oh, you may feel sorry for some of the little churches that you visited sometimes. You ever had that feeling? Somebody needs to help these people out. Well, be careful because that's our own kind of wisdom working there. Uh, they need to have elders of their own there. We need to have elders of our own here. But that's the way it works. Just because we don't, we don't want temple terrorists coming over here and telling us what to do. That would be wrong. And they don't want to do that. Because the elders in each congregation are supposed to look out for the flock that is among them. Be on guard, Paul told the Ephesian elders, for the church that you've been set over, the flock that is yours. Uh, Peter recognized the same thing, shepherd the flock which is among you. And if Hebrews 13 and verse 7 provides some other information about that, it says, look, here's what the elders, the rulers are supposed to do. They're supposed to give an account for the members. Now, how are they going to give an account for the members if they're in Rome and the members are scattered all over the world? If they're in Temple Terrace and the members are in Alabama, or if they're in Alabama and the members are in Temple Terrace, that's not going to work. There can be church cooperation. At last we get to that part. There can be church cooperation without violating these principles uh, of a uh, pattern in the uh, New Testament. For one thing, 
they cooperated together in preaching the gospel. And we have a couple of illustrations of that. Apostle Paul, talking to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8, says, I robbed other churches so I wouldn't be a burden to you. Now, he didn't really mean that he robbed them. He was using metaphorical language to make a powerful point to them. You did not support me while I was preaching here. I was supported by other churches while I was preaching here. And there were other churches who supported him. Not just one church, but other churches. But apparently they sent their money directly to Paul. They didn't send their money to Peter and then say, Peter, do something useful with this money, and then Peter sent it to Paul. They sent the money directly to Paul. He talks about the same thing when he talks to uh, the Philippian brethren and says, while I was there, you sent once and again to my needs. And that suggests, when he says once and again to my needs, suggests that it was on a as-needed basis. That there is no, like, no formal structure here. And some people will say, well, you know, that's archaic. That's the New Testament time and it was just getting started. And, you know, when you first get things started, they're not well organized, but it will be better organized later. And later they will have some kind of evangelistic center and everybody will send their money there and then they will send the preachers out from there. Well, that's not something we find in the New Testament. Not something we find at all in the New Testament. What we find in the New Testament is that congregations cooperated in preaching the gospel by sending their money to preachers they knew and trusted. And if more than one congregation sent their money to that preacher, then that preacher really is, in some ways, a source of their cooperation in preaching the gospel. And they are, in some ways, cooperating with those congregations where those brethren are preaching. We have how many preachers that we support? Eight? Ten now? We have ten. And in each of those cases, we know something about those particular brethren. And we know something about the work that they're doing. And we ought to be, uh, you know, paying attention to that. We ought to be uh, not only sending our money to them, but we ought to be praying for them and reading the reports and, and uh, having fellowship with them in that way. And there are other congregations who are doing the same thing. But that's very different than all the congregations getting together, the elders going to some central location, meeting together, and maybe trying to make some mutual decisions. It's a very different matter, but that's the New Testament pattern of cooperation in preaching the uh, Word. And there's cooperation in doing benevolence as well. And remember, we talked about uh, dividing the work of the church up as we see it in the New Testament in three categories, preaching and benevolence and edification. And, of course, the edification generally is not something we see the uh, New Testament churches uh, cooperating in because, well, that's a local matter, obviously, edifying, building up one another. But uh, we do see them cooperating in benevolence, and that's a topic that uh, receives a lot of consideration. Re particularly, we recognize that it was a great interest to Paul that he should help out the needy saints in Jerusalem. He had a personal interest in them. And they had a personal, I mean, they had an extraordinary need. Uh, as Agabus suggests, there was this uh, famine in all the land. And it was going to hit harder in Jerusalem than it was in other places. A variety of reasons for that being the case. And so there were brethren who were aware of that made aware of it by the Holy Spirit, made aware of it by Paul saying, this is a good work and I want to do this. And they cooperated together by collecting money, uh, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and entrusting it to messengers to take to the elders of those local congregations in, in uh, Jerusalem uh, to take care of the needs of the saints. And you note too here that there's this sense in which there is a clear recognition and uh, a, a protection of the autonomy of the local churches. Uh, they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. That's who they sent the money to. They didn't send the money to some kind of uh, human organization. They didn't send the money to some sponsoring church that then distributed it to the other congregations. They sent it to the elders of the churches that were in need. And you note, too, that the Apostle Paul is very careful to say, even though he is an apostle, and I think in a particular kind of way at that period of time, the apostles had some authority over more than one local church. There are no apostles today. 
But even Paul, with that kind of extraordinary mandate from God and the Holy Spirit, says, when you collect the money, and I'm going to take it down to Jerusalem, you can send whomever you want with the money to make sure that uh, you still have the oversight of it and that it is uh, distributed as you have intended that it should be distributed. So there is no, no, uh, no sense in which there is the beginnings of some kind of extra church organization that's going to take care of the needs of various peoples. There is no, uh, there is a sense on, on the other hand among these brethren and by Paul, we need to be very careful that you maintain control over the money that you raise for this need. And again, once, once again, we could do our own sort of reasoning about why the Lord decided that was the case, why the Apostle Paul, guided by the Holy Spirit, made that determination, was so very careful about that. Um, that really is irrelevant, but it certainly is, you know, it makes sense that if people are going to do good works and benevolence, um, that they ought to have some personal interest in it. Because um, we know how easy it is today and uh, this is a sense about the denominationalizing of the church. We have this sense about how easy it is that if we, uh, you know, feel like we ought to do some good to find some organization that's already personally in touch with needy people and just send our money, and then we feel like we've done a good deed. We've done a good job. But we need to be probably even in our personal benevolence more directly involved more personally in control of what we do with our money and more personally trying to help people out as opposed to just sending our money off in some impersonal way. But lots of the churches have gone that direction. We just collect the money. You know, it goes to some organization and uh, that organization takes care of the benevolence of the church. No, the church, the local church, the members of the local church need to be doing that good work. There is this kind of cooperation that is biblical, fits the pattern. But there's cooperation that is outside of the pattern as well, and that's what we need to be careful about. There is this institutionalism that is uh, of long standing among the denominations. And it just makes sense in a modern world because that's the way we organize when we do things. Uh, we were going to organize to... Uh, uh, engage in any kind of good work or any kind of work at all, we'd set up some kind of administration, we'd have some, some subcommittee here, we'd have some kind of supporting organization over here. Uh, that's just the way we do things. But that's not the way God does things. God has the right to establish the pattern by which he gets his work done. And uh, he doesn't uh, authorize any of these institutions. No matter how much you may say, well, will this be really, really good? Well, I think there is a principle at stake, and that is, is it our work? Is it the Lord's work? Is it our church? Is it the Lord's church? Is it our plan? Is it God's plan? Who's going to get the glory for when it gets to be done? You know, we built this great super organization, this cathedral, and from it emanate all kinds of good deeds all over the world. Who gets the credit for that? That's a real issue at stake. Um, interestingly enough, and this is really sort of irrelevant to the biblical pattern, but uh, the history is kind of interesting too. Uh, Alexander Campbell argued for this kind of institutionalism from the very beginning, that uh, he thought the work is uh, too big for small, struggling, new, restored churches of Christ, and uh, that we need to pool our money and our efforts and establish some institution so we can more effectively preach the gospel. And in fact, in 1849, the American uh, Christian Missionary Society was formed. You might uh, also note about history that it was uh, never supported by the majority of the restored New Testament churches. There were always uh, some who thought that was a great idea, but there were plenty who were opposed to it from the very beginning on uh, scriptural grounds. And you may also note that it was never very effective. Even though it absorbed a lot of money, it was typical of human institutions. Dare I put in a political note at this point in time. 
like governments that get bigger and bigger and bigger and form more and more uh, committees and more and more organizations and more and more institutions and have more and more administrators and need more and more money and get less and less done, so it was with the missionary society. It took in quite a bit of money, but it didn't never accomplish a whole lot. So if you were just using the standards of pragmatics, that would invalidate it as well. But that really is of no concern to us. Even if it had been the most successful institution in the history of the world, we still would have to object to it on the basis of the biblical pattern not including that kind of organization. This kind of institutionalism came back uh, in the 1950s with the... Uh, effort among some churches of Christ, so-called, to uh, teach the Bible in colleges. And uh, that was a good work. And they were very much concerned that the, the uh, Bible should be taught to young people. And uh, that was such a good work that the churches should support it so that it, uh, these uh, colleges uh, could uh, expand and uh, continue this good work. And there were plenty of congregations who said, that's a great thing. We, we have the work. The Bible tells us we have to teach the gospel. We have to spread the news. We have to, we have to uh, build one another up in the word. And here's the way we can do this. But it's outside of the biblical pattern. And there were lots of brethren who were opposed to it. And the battles of those uh, uh, generation uh, in the 50s and 60s were pretty bitter about that because there were those who saw the... Uh, uh, ones who stood against the institutions and on the biblical pattern as being legalistic, pharisaical, as being just obstructionist, as being just antis. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of ill will on the other side as well that, uh, you know, they, they uh, just uh, argued, made personal issues out of it. But a principle really was at stake. And uh, the lines were pretty clearly drawn. And, by the way, on a pragmatic basis, you can see the direction that those congregations have gone. Those who adopted this sort of institutionalism in terms of not only the colleges, but also the orphans' homes, which never were really very much. I mean, the issue really was the colleges. They brought in the orphans because that was a much more uh, useful emotional issue. But uh, the congregations who adopted those institutions, you can go to those places today and I guarantee you that you will recognize that they are very far from depending on the Word, that they are so big and involved in so many good works, so many human works, that they have forgotten the Word, and they are spiritually starved. Now, it may very well be, too, that you can go to lots of those anti-institutional churches, and they're starved, too, because they're still fighting those same battles. But... Uh, you, you, really can't, uh, you really can't argue on the basis of pragmatics, this was a success. The colleges themselves prove that it's not a success. Because we're talking about colleges like Abilene Christian College and uh, Texas Christian University, which may very well end up being the national championship in football, but that's a whole lot different than preaching the gospel, I can assure you. And those places you know, really are not close to the Word. And they're not close to their original mandate because they're human organizations and they go the way of human organizations. Well, there's the other kind, sponsoring churches, that also arose in the 50s. Uh, this uh, idea literally began with the Herald of Truth in 1952. And uh, the Herald of Truth uh, was a uh, really great idea. We're supposed to be preaching the Word. We have these modern sort of technologies available to us, radio. And we need to take advantage of the radio and have a nationwide radio program preaching the truth. And, of course, part and parcel of this, envy a little bit of the denominations. Because the denominations had nationwide programs. And we need to have nationwide programs. On the one hand, we need to have nationwide programs to refute that nationwide error. But on the other hand, they got national programs. We need national programs, the denominationalization of the Church of Christ. And so this begins with uh, the Highland Church and the support of dozens of other smaller congregations uh, 
contributing to the Highland Church and the elders there who make the decisions, you see, about who preaches and what message is preached. There is no autonomy for these local elders. They have become just collection agents for the bigger church. And in many ways, you can see the impact of that on some of those churches. There are lots of very small institutional churches that are just kind of satellites. You know, they take the materials. They make no decisions. I mean, I've been amazed over the past uh, few uh, uh, months here where we've had the men of the congregation create their own materials, teach their own classes, preach their own lessons. You don't get that in those kind of churches. They are too dependent. And that really begins with this whole idea of you collect the money, we'll make the decisions what to do with that. Now, there are lots of good arguments that people make for these kinds of uh, extra-biblical kind of cooperation. Uh, one of them is that the divine institution, the universal church, is the totality of all the local congregations. That all the local congregations added together produce the universal church. And we talked about this before. That is not the case. Do you see what the problem is with that? These local congregations run by elders that are appointed by the preachers or chosen from among the members, you know, are the agents by which the church reaches into the world and accomplishes its work. But all of those congregations added together do not make up the universal church. The universal church is the body of Christ. It is the collectivity of the saved. It is that uh, body to whom the Lord adds those who are being saved, according to Acts 2 and 42. We make decisions in local congregations about who we accept as members and who we exclude as members. We have a responsibility, in fact, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, to exclude from fellowship some of those people that are disruptive or some of those people that are uh, bringing shame on the church. But we sure can't have anything to do with determining the membership of the universal church. God opens that door and God closes that door. So the churches together don't make up the universal church. It's the individual Christians who are members of those congregations who make up the universal church. And the individual churches do not collectively together make decisions about what is the work of or how the work of the universal church ought to be carried out. Jesus is the head of the universal church. We can't even collect together the best wisdom of the best elders from the best congregations and make those decisions. It is Jesus who makes those decisions as the head of the church. Secondly, they argue that the work requires a larger organization in the local churches. Look at the weak local congregations and uh, the multiplicity of the work that they do. It is just ineffective from a human point of view. You look at the situation around the uh, county here, and you probably could count, we've gone through that exercise uh, some evenings, counting up the number of congregations within driving distance. And you may get 25, you may get 50, depends on how far you're willing to drive. But there are a lot of them, and some of them are pretty small. We got some now that are pretty big, but uh, most of them are pretty small. And from a human point of view, we may say, well, they're small and they're weak and they need to collect together. The work is too big. The fields are white with the harvest. We need to have a better organization. We need to have more effective means of getting out and getting this work done. Well, that makes sense if, in fact, we're just talking about a denomination. If we're just talking about a human organization, that's all we can do. But we're not allowed to do that when we're talking about the church. There is a pattern for the church. And when we get past that pattern, we have gone into some areas where we ought not to be. Pragmatically, I could argue against that pattern too. But this is a pragmatic argument. Pragmatic arguments is just who shouts the loudest or who brings about the best statistics or makes up the best statistics. That's not really the basis on which we make these decisions, is the authority of the Scripture. There's the argument made by the Catholic Church. Without some super organization and control, it's just chaos. We just have one congregation after the other going off in this kind of heresy, that kind of heresy, the other kind of heresy. 
You know, in some ways, we have the same kind of thing that uh, exists among brethren today. And uh, we use that expression, among brethren, because uh, we're trying not to talk about the universal church or about some super organization that is uh, presiding over the local congregations, but there are some brethren who think they are a part of this kind of, you know, shadow organization above all the local congregations, and they can decide the issues among the different congregations, and they can decide which ones are sound and which ones are heretics. They can make those decisions, and they can print articles, or they can put on the Internet, here are the criteria by which we will determine this. Here is, oh, we wouldn't call it our manual or our discipline. We wouldn't call it our code of belief. But these are the criteria by which we're going to separate out who is and who isn't a, uh, a uh, authorized church of Christ. That gets pretty close to this idea of denominations. We have a super organization that decides who is and who is not a part of us. Well, that's stepping beyond the bounds of uh, what God has given us to do. God determines who, as individual Christians, are members of the universal church. Not some group of men, whatever kind of good intentions they have, or what kind of organization they've established, or however careful they are to use the right terminology, but to step outside their bounds. Well, that's kind of an argument. Uh, that uh, has been made to support this kind of cooperation. When you do this, what you find out is that the unique divine organization, the Church of Christ, has become just another human institution with all the problems and whatever benefits there may be of human wisdom and human organization about those things. But you see, there are certain principles that are violated, and there are certain consequences of that. History proves that it's too dangerous to allow ourselves to get caught up in this sort of, uh, of uh, innovations and this sort of extra-biblical cooperation. Um, and for a while, you know, it seemed as if the, in the 50s and 60s that the churches that cooperated together were thriving and successful and the ones that, uh, you know, ma remained autonomous on the principle of New Testament pattern were not doing so very well. But as time has gone on, I think the evidence is pretty clear. When you go to those congregations, and they have big buildings. I mean, I, I remember the amazement of my uh, children when we went into the first one of those institutional churches and they saw a basketball court. Well, that's a good thing from their point of view. I said, no, we got to talk about this. And then when you hear the sermons, and they are not really based on Scripture, that's not really their focus. That's not what they're about. And, uh, you know, there was the, the, uh, the couple visiting across the country, and they'd been careful to look up Church of Christ, and they, you know, they went there on Wednesday night, and the parking lot was full, and the door was open, and there was nobody in the auditorium. And they were standing around kind of puzzled, and the fellow came up from the uh, the uh, basement and uh, said, oh, we're glad to have you here. Tonight is entertainment night. And they said, entertainment ain't what we're here for, and they left. Because that's not what we're here for. Fishes and loaves is not the issue. The issue is the salvation of men's souls. And changing the nature of the organization does seem ultimately to distort the purpose of the institution. Pragmatic argument, but history does tell us something about that. There are errors involved in this kind of church cooperation. There is no authority, first of all. No authority. I hate to be like a broken record about that, but where is your authority for doing these kind of things? We ought to be always be careful about that, everything we do. And maybe we'll be convicted on our own principles that what you're doing is not based on biblical authority. You don't have any authority for that. And we ought to be honest enough when we find that out, when we're convicted of that, to give it up. You know, there are big debates about the Bible classes. And of course, we're always careful to say Bible classes for the young people. Because we don't want Sunday schools. Because if you establish Sunday schools as separate organizations with their own budget and with their own administration, pretty soon you got something that clearly is not a part of biblical authority. 
But it does seem like it's consistent with the biblical pattern for us to have different classes for different ages and for different topics. Under the oversight of the brethren, under the oversight of the local congregation, the elders. Institutionalism gives glory to the wrong people and to the wrong institution rather than the glory that belongs to the church. We go back to Ephesians chapter 3 that the church is to display the manifold wisdom of God, not the manifold wisdom of man, not the pragmatic kind of results of man's efforts, but the manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God might be known through the church, and, and not just to the people of this world, but to the rulers in high places, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Not the glory that goes to the herald of truth, not the glory that goes to some college, not the glory that goes to uh, some other human institution, but the glory that belongs to the church that is the body of Jesus Christ. We don't want to besmirch that or steal away from that. Sponsoring churches take away local elders' scripturally assigned responsibilities and functions. Elders are to be responsible for the work of this congregation of which they are a part. They are ultimately accountable for the souls of those people who are members of that congregation. They cannot do that from afar. They must be a part of that congregation and they must not give up their responsibility to some other elder somewhere else or some other institution. And I can tell you this, as I've emphasized a couple times before, a step in this direction almost always leads to another step and another step until finally we have something that is not recognizable as the church that we read about in the New Testament. Those patterns denominationalize the church. We have our institutions. They have their institutions, their denomination, we're denomination. Heaven forbid that we should ever follow into that pattern and become just a human denomination. We want to be, as a local congregation here, as close to the pattern of the New Testament as possible. We want to be a part of the New Testament Church of Christ. Lower KC Church of Christ. And I know that's hard to maintain because we live in a world of institutions. We live in a world of denominations. But we ought to work really hard to maintain that because it's important. Um, another interesting principle here is the sponsoring churches um, enrich themselves at the expense of the smaller ones. You know, the, the benevolence that is practiced in the New Testament was to take from those that were doing well and to give to those that were suffering. That there might be equality, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, that your abundance might supply their necessity. And the, the, the pattern we see, little, small, struggling churches are sending money to the big sponsoring churches and they get richer and more and more powerful while the others, you know, seem to be struggling. That's just not a part of the biblical pattern at all. Okay, thanks for everybody's attention this morning.